Hi everyone, let's talk about Teotihuacan, which straight away I'll say I think is an absolutely fantastic game. It's been a joy to play through and yeah, I absolutely love it. So let's get into it. <laughs> I had been saying for I don't know how long when I knew that the game had been announced and that basically the only buzzword that I knew was that it's it's from the designer of Zolk in the Mayan Calendar, which if you, if you don't know is, is a great game from a few years ago where the, the, the gimmick, the 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 big, uh, the big hook to the game is these great big gears that will turn every round and it's a worker placement game where you will pop your workers on there and the longer you leave them on the more rewards you'll get. That is the, the core crux of the game. And uh, so this being a spiritual sequel to that, well fantastic, I'm in. When we got to the UK Games Expo and we actually played the game, we realised that, oh, actually, this is nothing like Zulkin in, in a good way, that it's it's absolutely fantastic, but theme-wise, it's it's got similarities, and you've got temple tracks in both of the games, but other than that, they are wildly different. There is a game from NSKN from a few years ago as well called Versailles that uh, we don't have, but I've played it, I promise. And that has a similar mechanism where the, the board is this giant rondelle that has these different places on it, and you have multiple workers, and you want to group up your workers to take more powerful actions in those locations. Uh, I've heard as well that it's similar to another NSKN game called Praetor. Not that it's got you know, huge elements from it, it's its own thing, but it draws from that. But I haven't played that one, so I can't speak about that. Anyway, draws from a really fantastic game that I think anyway. So Teotihuacan itself. I love how much variability there is in the game for a start. Not only are there new, there's, there's stuff printed on the board for you to have just a basic game, but then everything from the, the sheer amount of discovery tiles that are in the game, different every time. The rewards you get for being at the top of the temple is different every time. The action spots in the palace, different every time. The technology tiles available every game, different every time. And not only all of these you know, variable tiles and things, the actual locations, apart from two of them that are going to be in the same place, the actual locations on the board can be different every time. You know, you can presumably you know, use as much or as little of that as you want, but yeah, vastly different. And then you've got the, you can, you can have a set starting amount of resources and things and put your workers here that's printed in the rule book, or here are a load of random tiles. You know, draw some and pick which, uh, which resources and positions you want to start with. And for the, for the two player game as well, it's got the, the dummy players that will move around the, the, the blocker dice. You know, they haven't got turns or any maintenance to keep up with. But yeah, they've they've just got the uh, they just move at the end of every after every eclipse, and they are going to yeah in a bad way make locations more expensive. Certain spots will probably be harder to go to or less likely for you to go there. But also, it increases the chance of you getting a big payout of cocoa if you go there. So it's uh, it's a nice balance that's that's in the present in the game itself as well. I've only played two players, so I'll be speaking about that. But in a four player game as well, having all of these people on the board, having all of the dices in one place be terrible for you in terms of cost, but then you have that, you always have that option of going there to collect cocoa. That is a really interesting balance because you will, you know, you'll never have enough. You will always end up running out of it and having to, you know, change your plans. It's, it's a, it's a brilliant uh, balance between you having these long-term things, you can see the discovery tiles there, you can see which temples you want to get to the top of, you can see maybe, oh, based on all of this stuff that's come out, okay, this, there are a few technology tiles out here that really reward going up the avenue of the dead or doing buildings, doing the noble action quite a lot, so maybe I want to make it so I can really, really take advantage of that. So you can form these these overarching long-term plans over the course of the game based on what you can see out there, based on all of these various elements that I talked about. But the, the sheer fact that everyone else can do that as well, and that so many of these things can be used in different ways, that you know the perfect discovery tile for you or the perfect technology tile for you right now, you know, the, the thing that influences the noble action might also give bonuses to people doing the building action as well. So by people not necessarily having similar plans to you at all, they will end up getting in your way. You know, you will need basic resources for all of these things. They, you know, a person will end up going into a spot that you've worked out this 
perfect plan for your next couple of turns and you have just enough cocoa for it and you know, you're going to stack up all of your workers on here and get a load of resources and then take a big building action and everything's perfect and planned out in your head and then a person just needed one more gold and put their one dice on there and now a new colour is present on there and you can't afford to do this big plan and now you've got to you know reconfigure the whole thing it's it's got that great balance that you know you you can have as i said those plans but at any second it can all fall apart and you have to have you know you have to have a plan b ready you have to have a backup you can't just rely on that plan working out and all of these things changing through the course of the game and you know, just the the number of workers can be adjusted throughout the game as well that suddenly there are even more dice on because everyone really wants that extra worker when they ascend and i know that i always want an extra worker but that's balanced out by having to pay for your workers every eclipse you you, you might want to just have your workers you know, your workers a dice and their their numbers will increase over the course of the game and for the resource gathering spaces anyway and and the technology tile higher numbers can be much more lucrative but at the same time when it comes to feeding they're going to cost more and more and losing all of that cocoa just to pay for the workers might crush you when it comes to wanting to actually take an action but you know ascending gives you great bonuses but you really want to keep those numbers out but you have to power them up if you are only sending those big numbers around there are so many you know variables and things floating around in this game but really, it's it's. I don't want to make it out to be a really you know complex, you know, in, impossible, impenetrable thing to start playing because yeah, it is just pick a location, one, two, or three spaces in front of where one of your workers is, and not always, but you've you've probably got you can collect cocoa, do the action, or do a worship action. It offers so much choice in that uh, in that limited space, but yeah, it just it does come down to. Okay, well, I, I can't go to that location. I can't afford to do this, so maybe I can do that. Oh, actually, if if I forego this action and do this this, this uh, worship action instead, I can actually take this step up this temple that's going to give me the resource I need to do this next round. Or I can step up to this temple that's going to put me on a discovery tile, and I'm going to choose the one that puts me up this temple, and that's going to give me uh, a cocoa, which is going to let me afford this next time. It, Yeah, these things can combo really, really beautifully. And yeah, there's so much in the air, so many different scoring opportunities that I'm sure combined with the the variability that's built in the game. I've only played this three, four, four times if you count the uh, the fake, uh, the not fake, I've played against Glass Marty. He's a proper opponent. If you count that as a play, I've played it four times. Uh, but uh, yeah, and so I've only really scratched the surface of you know, just how different this is going to be every time. But I really love that you can just i'm going to be you know building these houses everywhere this round i am going to really really go for the temple i really want a game that ends in the temple being fully built as well because i just want to see that out on the board it's uh, it looks great as you're going up there yeah that's that's a good point to mention the the components really nice quality just you know standard nice uh nice strength punch board <laughs> but uh the the tiles are a really nice touch as well it does feel like you are building something substantial up on the table that, uh, that yeah, I imagine if you get it all the way complete as well, it's just going to look brilliant. But that that's another variable thing I didn't mention as well. The symbols on those tiles that are uh, coming out different every time, you're going to have more in a two-player game to you know, get give you a bit of a leg up building that temple. But uh, yeah, that very, very different as well. The solo mode, I've only played once. There is a selection of tiles that you will shuffle through and draw for to simulate a dummy player that has you know slightly powered up actions to you know, compensate for the fact that he's not actually making decisions. I definitely want to play it more. It's designed by David Tortsey, who you know designed Dice Settlers, Pocket Dragon, Redacted, Anachrony, Games, Games, Games. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a really it's it's always a nice option to have a solo mode. But even better to have one that isn't just play the game as normal and try and beat your highest score. You have got a a, a bit of a cheating uh, AI to compete against as well. That is not much overhead, but does really you know, not quite like a a normal opponent, but definitely gives you a different experience, a different way to think about the game and. An opportunity to play it when uh, when you haven't got or don't want to play it with anyone else right now. Yeah, it's it's got so much packed in there. You know what's 
I, I don't know what to complain about with this. Can't I just be happy about a game? Can't I just rave about a game? Yeah, it's maybe... There have been definitely been times when it's it's been a bit AP prone and I have just been <laughs> just kind of at a loss for a while. But if we're going to start criticising my AP, then a lot of games will get put down with that. Yeah, there's there's maybe yeah, there's, there's some symbology to get used to. It would be nice to have a little player aid, maybe, to remind you of these things, to remind you, just, just for your few, first few games, maybe, to remind you that you, you know, when you're collecting cocoa, it's the number of different colours that were already there, plus one, and paying this when you take the normal action, paying this when you take the worship action, the the little player aid for the eclipses that, that is on the board, it is just underneath the eclipse marker. It'd be nice to have that, you know, in front of you as well, rather than just a small thing on the board. It's a tiny thing, though. That I haven't even talked about the eclipse marker. That is brilliant as well. It makes this uh, this this escalation of the game that you know it seems the first eclipse is is taking quite a while. We've got ages in this game. It's going to go on for quite a while. This we've got so many rounds left. Look how long this first eclipse took. Well, just the virtue of you bringing the eclipse uh, marker one space forward after that first scoring, it's only got one shorter now. But you know the chances are your dice are all going to be middling numbers maybe and are going to be closer towards ascension that triggers another eclipse marker movement and yeah what seemed like a really good amount of time to get things done and get things planned in that first eclipse rapidly gets shorter and shorter and the game just keeps picking up pace and as you are doing these more powerful things and having these these better workers or all of these different technologies or you've got these discovery tiles to combine together now while all of that is building up, you've also got less and less and less time to to see your plans realised. And yeah, it can be you know, agonising when you see these ascensions keep popping off, or you see that you know I I really want this perfect sequence of actions to happen, but it's going to cause an ascension, and that's going to give me one fewer round to get what I want done. So I'm going to have to scramble now to see if I can get another worker then again. But it's going to take me an extra round to do that. So is that really helping me? It's, so many brilliant, uh, brilliant decisions to be made, and lovely, you know, s surprises coming up that force you to rethink your plan and just desperately see. I've got this amount of time left. How can I do it? I really like as well that when the eclipses happen, everybody is going to get one more turn. No one's ever going to be caught off guard by someone just forcing an eclipse to you know seeing you haven't got any food and forcing an eclipse, and now you're stuck. You can play a sudden death variant. There is, you know talking about more different things that you can add on to it, there's a sudden death variant where that can happen. You know, as soon as the eclipse is triggered, you have it. And now everyone's got to score the points or pay for their workers straight away. But the way the game usually works, everyone has a round to prepare. So you're not caught off guard. You know, if you can't feed your people, you've been given quite a good chance. You saw the eclipse coming and then you were given an extra round to do it. So yeah, it's, it's on you when you can't pay for your workers. Having said that, there's been a fair few times when I haven't been able to pay for my workers. It's my fault though, isn't it? But there was a whole giant playthrough of this game. There is even a rules video for it. There will be a playlist somewhere in this corner, probably in this corner where it's not you know, right underneath me. There's credits underneath me, isn't there? Anyway, I loved Teotihuacan. I, don't, I haven't just looked up the pronunciation on Google, so I've probably pronounced it in a different and less accurate way, if it was even accurate in the beginning. I tried my best, didn't I? And that's all you can really ask of me, pronunciation-wise. I can barely do English properly. Anyway, loads of different options. Look at the playthrough, decide for yourself. I really loved it. Maybe you will too. But yeah, all of those other things are there for you to decide. I am just a rambly man, rambling on about a game that I thought was fantastic. That is Teotihuacan. And yeah, check out the other videos and things. Subscribe to the channel if you want. Thanks for watching, everyone. Bye.